What if I told you that there was an NBA player in the early 80s who was destined to be a Hall of Famer one day? A player who was faster than anyone else on the court and can score and play make with the best of them. But what if I also told you that this player is now known more for his downfall than what he brought on the hardwood? That player was Fast Eddie Johnson. Let's get into it. I'm off of here, so I guess I'm labeled a head hunter. Throw me on the verse, and I promise you probably last longer. Moving through the masses, I'm crashing the main circuit. Too bad because I had the plans to be modest, remain cold. Eddie Johnson, or Fast Eddie as he was known as on the court due to his speed and quickness on the hardwood, was born in Ocala, Florida on February 24, 1955, the oldest of five children. Eddie was one of the first black students to attend an all-white elementary school and was always a great student in the classroom. When he got to high school, Fast Eddie was a superstar player starting all four years and went on to start at Auburn University for all four years. In just his freshman season alone, he averaged 21.8 points per game, and by the end of his standout collegiate career, he averaged 19.5 points per game and 5 assists per game. Now, Auburn's head coach at the time, Bob Davis, was quoted as saying that Eddie Johnson was difficult to coach because he had a bad attitude, but little did he know how bad it was going to get for Fast Eddie as the years went on. This went along with him experimenting with drugs while still in college as well. Following his outstanding collegiate career, he was drafted to the Atlanta Hawks in the third round as the 49th overall pick. In his rookie year, he ended up helping the Hawks get to the playoffs for the first time in four years. And in the next year, 1979, he became the starter. In that same year, during the celebration at Auburn, Johnson collapsed and passed out. This was the first public display and indication of him having drug issues. He was such a great player that he was voted in as a starter on the All-Star team in two consecutive years in 1980 and 1981. But wait, in the year 1980, he had another incident involving his drug use where he jumped from a second-story apartment balcony and fled across the parking lot as two men fired shots at him in a drug deal or dispute gone terribly bad. Investigators said that Johnson repeatedly lied to them about the situation and refused to press charges. Eddie claimed that this was a lie and that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Throughout all of his arrests, the theme that is always present is a lack of accountability from him. The actual story is that Eddie ripped off some of the drug dealers and beat up a pimp's woman, so two men were sent after him to kill him. At this time, Fast Eddie was just a problem ready to erupt in the NBA, but he was such a great player, it didn't matter. His second year in the league, he averaged 16 points per game. In his third year, he averaged 18.5. And in his fourth year, he averaged 19.1 to go along with 5.4 assists. Just three weeks after being shot at, he was arrested for cocaine possession in Atlanta. But the charges were dropped due to an illegal search and seizure. Things were very bad for Eddie. And if he didn't get the help he sorely needed, his future Hall of Fame career was going to be over quicker than he could spell his name. He was taken to a private psychiatric facility by the Hawks in Atlanta to undergo therapy for about a week. He was diagnosed with manic depression by the psychiatrist there, which he doubted the accuracy of. A week later, he was arrested yet again for stealing a car from a dealership, but the charges had been dropped yet again. Johnson had been prescribed lithium tablets with which he stopped taking during the 1980-1981 season without the Atlanta Hawks knowledge because he felt he no longer needed them and didn't like how tired the medication made him feel during the games. It was ever so clear to everyone around that he was dealing with mental health issues and it would only get worse from this point forward. See, Eddie was a small town country boy and being in a city like Atlanta, he was introduced and surrounded by a bunch of hanger-ons and leeches. He admitted that it was hard for him to say no to things because he was so young and everybody around him was feeding his ego. He showed up to training camp in October of 1981 being incredibly disruptive. He fought teammates, he would lead a floor to play with kids in the stands and would do things on the sidelines while being oblivious to his surroundings during practice. The Hawks were so alarmed by his actions they had to make a call to Johnson's psychiatrist and had to sign a commitment in order to have Johnson picked up and taken to the hospital. I explained this in my Houston Rockets video, but this was during the time when the NBA was in a free fall due to the rampant drug use and the league was on the verge of tanking. Eddie returned to the team after his last stint in the hospital and was screened regularly for drugs and his uses of his lithium medication. Now, the Hawks had another problem on their hands away from the drugs, and that was the fact that the lithium medication that he was taking was making him gain weight and fast. Going into the 1982 season, Eddie came into training camp almost 40 pounds overweight due to the increased doses of his lithium. 
but what could you do if you were trying to save a superb basketball player off the court and keeping him at the top of his game on the court? The weight gain clearly affected Fast Eddie's game and his greatest attribute, his speed, was diminished quite a bit. Johnson also battled with a ton of injuries while trying to keep his personal life steady. And by the time 1985 rolled around, the decline of his promising career was coming to a head. One of the premier guards of the early 1980s who was once averaging 19 a game and almost 6 assists a game could barely muster 10 points per game at the end of his 10 year career. The NBA was cracking down on the rampant drug use that nearly destroyed the league in the 1980s and implemented their own three strikes law to curtail the situation. And right in their crosshairs was Eddie receiving a lifetime ban in 1987 after testing positive for cocaine for the last time. And this was after the NBA forced him into another stint in rehab with which he didn't last, just like all of the other times. The NBA kept him as contained as it possibly could, and without it, the man formerly known as Fast Eddie was completely lost with and without purpose. It did seem like for a few years he was trying his best to stay on the straight and narrow, but there was just something in his brain that wouldn't allow himself to break free. But the wild ride was just getting started after his lifetime ban from the NBA. Eddie racked up over 100 arrests on his record after 1987, from writing bad checks, robbery, intent to sell drugs to an undercover officer, and SA multiple times. Eddie was out on the streets and the basketball world was shocked to see just how far he had fallen. Per his own words, he felt that it was necessary for some adults to use hard drugs to cope with their stresses. In 1987, he served 18 months in prison, and when he got out, he ended up going right back for another 30-month stint in 1989 for burglarizing two properties and Larson. At this point, it would take a miracle to save him from himself, and that miracle would never come because things would get a whole lot worse. In 1997, guess what happened? After being released again, he goes back to prison again, this time for violating probation, charged with delivering and selling cocaine. He was released on bail, then immediately sent back to jail for child abuse and resisting arrest. One has to believe that much like the situation with, with Delonte West, Eddie's mental health issues were too much for him to overcome on his own and being out on the street exacerbated the problem. Through the early 2000s, he tallied up double digit arrests that consisted of the same mess he had been getting himself into. But the year 2006 was his most serious situation he had found himself in. So let's talk about it. Eddie Johnson decided to enter an apartment home uninvited and found an 8 year old girl there babysitting her 3 brothers. He forced one of the boys to lock the front door, made the little girl go into the bedroom where he would follow her and committed an absolutely heinous crime that isn't even worth mentioning. You guys understand where I'm going with this right? He told the girl not to tell anyone about what just happened, ran out of the building and when the girl's mother came home and was told about the situation, she immediately called the police. Johnson had officially fallen from grace and hit rock bottom. No excuse could get him out of this one, and he didn't deserve to be given grace, not even a little bit. Mind you, he was already awaiting trial for doing the same thing to a 25-year-old woman just a few weeks prior to attacking an 8-year-old girl, and the judge and the jury threw him under the jail. Life in prison, no possibility of parole. Such a sad, sad shame. Sad, sad shame. He passed away in 2020 from a mysterious illness, and with as many drugs that he was experimenting with out in the streets, it wouldn't surprise me if he died from that uncurable disease that we all know about. And that's the rise and fall of Fast Eddie Johnson. From future Hall of Fame potential, scum of the earth. Y'all be easy. I'm off of here, so I guess I'm labeled a headhunter. Throw me on the verse, and I promise you'll probably last longer. Moving through the masses, I'm crashing the main circuit. Too bad, because I had the plans to be modest, remain close.